Welcome back to the Der Show. Um, today, obviously, we're going to talk about the verdict that just came down in the uh, Gene Carroll versus Donald Trump civil uh, rape case. Strange, strange verdict, and uh, one that uh, will be a raw shock test, obviously. Uh, for those who support Trump, it will be a victory. For those who oppose uh, Trump, it will be a defeat. Let's first set out the facts so anybody can decide for themselves. The main charge against Donald Trump was that he raped, he raped Miss Carroll in a uh, changing room in Bergdorf Goodman. And the judge told the jury what rape meant, and it included what she claimed happened to her namely that Donald Trump forcibly and without consent inserted his fingers and then his private parts in, in, into her vagina. That clearly constitutes rape. That was the major charge. The jury obviously didn't believe her. The jury said, no, he did not rape her. Remember, this is not a criminal case. In a criminal case, if you get an acquittal, you can't say the jury necessarily didn't believe her because they could, they could have said, yeah, she's probably telling the truth. But we have a reasonable doubt in a criminal case. You have to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, not in a civil case. In a civil case, you have to prove it by 50.1 to 49.9. Basically, you have to prove it or disprove it. And, and the way I interpret this jury verdict, it's they just didn't believe her testimony that she was raped. All right. But then they did believe her testimony, apparently, that she was subject to sexual abuse and, and battery. In other words, what they seem to be saying is that we believe the part that says they went into the dressing room together and he touched her and grabbed her inappropriately. Uh, but we don't believe the part that he actually raped her. Uh, it's very hard to understand how a jury can come to that conclusion. But, you know, juries in, in civil cases, nine people, and they came to the unanimous uh, conclusion. Then they also came to the unanimous conclusion that Donald Trump maliciously defamed her. That is that he knowingly and falsely said that it never happened. She made it up and she's not my type and all of that thing. Very foolish for Trump to have said that, that she's not my type juries don't like that. Judges don't like that. And I don't like that. And a lot of people don't like that, uh, that you keep to yourself. Um, in any event, uh, so we have this mixed verdict. Um, and uh, Trump, you know, will will declare it as to be a, a victory. He's also already said it's part of the whole, you know, get Trump, get Trump. It's part of the whole uh, mechanism by which people are trying to uh, prevent him from running for president. Um, and it's focused right now in New York. We have a New York jury. And, you know, the interesting thing about this jury that almost nobody has been really commenting on is that maybe it's happened before. I've only been a lawyer for, I don't know, 60 years. So I'm inexperienced and naive. Maybe it's happened before. But I have to tell you, I never remember a case, even the mafia cases, terrorist cases, where nobody gets to know the name of the jurors except the judge. Um, the uh, names of the jurors were not told to the defense lawyer or the, or the plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, how do you pick a jury, particularly in New York, where 80 something percent, uh, maybe as high as 87 percent of voters voted against Donald Trump? How do you pick a jury without doing your due diligence? It's essentially malpractice. If I get a jury, the first thing I do is look up on social media. I, I have somebody do it. I'm not a social media maven. I have an investigator look up every single tweet they've ever sent, every single social media pace posting, every single Facebook. I want to know everything I can about the jury. Hypothetically, what if you got nine jurors or even only one juror? But what if you got nine jurors, all of whom said in advance, uh, we think Trump's a rapist. We think he's a terrible person. We think he's this. We think he's that. And we hope to get on the jury because that way we can find him guilty without regard to the evidence. That didn't happen. But what if that had happened? How would you know about that? Voir dire, asking the jury questions, they lie. They lie all the time. Uh, we know that. We know that in the um, 
in uh, the, the case involving Harvey Weinstein, uh, there was a juror who was writing a book that she, that she wanted to have as a bestseller about uh, an old man taking advantage of a younger woman. And, 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 and she didn't disclose it and denied other things. And other jurors denied other things. One juror had been molested as, as, a, as a child in, in one of these cases and uh, denied it on the, on the juror form. So the only way you get to know what jurors actually have done and believe is by doing an independent investigation. That's your right under the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution, which requires trial by jury. By the way, the Seventh Amendment should be interpreted the way it was intended when it was passed as part of the Bill of Rights in the 18th century. And juries in those days were not nine. They were 12. They were unanimous in some states. You don't need unanimity, although the Supreme Court is now holding that. You do in criminal cases. And you don't keep the names of the jurors from the defense attorneys. The defense attorneys have the right to know the names of the jurors. So if Donald Trump were not the defendant in this case, this would be an easy case for reversal on appeal on so many grounds. The statute of limitations, you don't let a case go forward. That's a quarter of a century old, especially when it's a he said, she said, and especially when in the end, the jury says, well, we believe some of what she said, but not others of what she said. 20, what, 25, 27 years ago. That's that's preposterous. You know, I I imagine you can let it happen if it's a three-year-old child or a five-year-old child. Even there, it's very, very problematic. But this is an adult woman who had access to the media who had access to police, who had access to professionals, who had access to friends who she claimed she told about this thing, why didn't she report it? Uh, The statute of limitations shouldn't give somebody an opportunity to come back years later when the person is running for president and have a lawyer who's paid for, you know, by his political opponents come and and, and bring the case. Uh, Statutes of limitations serve a very, very important function. And again, if his name was not Donald Trump, I do not think a court would uphold the extension of the statute of limitations to 25 years or even more after it's already expired. Once it's expired, the case is over. That's the rule in criminal cases, but it hasn't been the rule in civil cases. Maybe this case will establish that as the rule. It certainly should. And then take, for example, the Access Hollywood tape. The Access Hollywood tape is exactly the opposite of what Donald Trump is accused of doing. In the Access Hollywood case, he essentially says, I don't have to rape anybody. I don't have to molest anybody. Women welcome me touching their private parts because I'm a celebrity. Absurd, ridiculous, horrible. He shouldn't have said it. And good reason to vote against them. And probably some people did. It was done on the eve of the 2016 election. But it's not in any way probative of whether he forcibly raped somebody against their wishes. It's exactly the opposite. And yet it's so prejudicial. And the judge should never, ever, ever have let it in any more than he should have let in the testimony about other women who claim to have been in similar situations to to Donald Trump. So this this case never should have been brought to trial. Um, and it should be reversed on appeal, but his name is Donald Trump. And I can't give you any assurances. I'm pretty good at predicting outcomes of cases, been doing it a long time. Um, but when the plaintiff or defendant's name is Donald Trump, I can't offer any kind of predictions because the normal rules just don't apply. I prove that in my book at Trump over and over again. I demonstrate how there's been special justice, injustice, against Donald Trump. And I'm no Donald Trump supporter. I'm furious at Donald Trump. And we'll talk about this tomorrow in the whole Trump family for being in in Florida and having an event at his hotel uh, in Miami Beach, in which they invited as one of their speakers, a Nazi, a Nazi who claimed that Hitler did the right thing and that the Jews killed Lincoln, um, uh, McKinley, uh, Kennedy, and uh, were involved in the 9-11 uh, towers shoot down uh, and, and, and kill little children and suck their blood. I mean, he's speaking with the Trump family member and with others who were in the Trump administration 
in in um, Miami, Florida. So I'm no fan of a lot of the things that that the Trump people are doing. Now he he's not coming to this event, as far as I know. But too many people, too closely associated with him, are too closely associated with these Nazis. Nobody should be in the same room with this guy. His name is uh, McCain. Uh, McCain. And McHale, was it? McKay. 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 What's his first name? Do you remember? Uh, we'll, we'll, Scott McKay. Scott McKay. Um, look him up. Look him up. The guy is a goddamn Nazi. Yeah, I would defend his right to march through Skokie, but I sure as hell hoped he would slip on a banana peel and fall under a truck. I mean, the guy does not deserve uh, to, to be in the same room with any decent people. I don't believe for one second that any of the Trumps or any of the people who are going to be at this event, support his views. But they're afraid of disassociating themselves. They'll lose six votes among neo-Nazi supporters. No, you have to have courage and guts. And you have to disassociate yourself, just like the Democrats have to disassociate themselves from Elon Omer and AOC, who are bigots. Um, and I call it both sides. I'm not going to give you the side to pass on this one. And I'm hoping if any of you have contact with the Trump family, I've already written emails to the people I know in the Trump family and the Trump side saying, do not be associated with this person. Do not lend your good family name to this Nazi. And I hope maybe they'll listen. Maybe they'll listen to you if they don't listen to me. But please write to anybody in the Trump family that you have access to telling them that they shall not be in the same room as this Nazi, not a neo-Nazi. He's an old fashioned Hitler Nazi using the same tropes as Nazis used in the 1930s and the 1940s. So I'm not a supporter of everything Trump does by any means. I'm a strong opponent of many of the things he does, but I defend his rights. I would also defend the rights of the Nazis if they were being tried for something and, and, and they were being denied the benefit of the statute of limitations or the benefit of any other constitutional rules, knowing the names of juries. Yeah, I would defend them. I'd spit on them, but I would defend them. That's my job as a, as a lawyer. I don't pick my clients based on whether I like them or don't like them. I pick my clients based on the Constitution, whether or not their rights have been violated under the Constitution. And so Donald Trump's rights were violated under the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't only apply to uh, criminal cases. The Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment apply to criminal cases. The Fourth Amendment uh, applies to all privacy issues, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, homes, whatever. Um, that's not a criminal um, uh, uh, amendment. And the Seventh Amendment applies, provides trial by jury, as trial by jury was practiced in the 1790s. And that's been denied to Donald Trump in this case today. He was not given the right to trial by jury because the right to trial by jury includes the right to question jurors based on information that you are able to secure. And keeping the names of jurors anonymous violates that core principle. It also violates trial by jury when you deny jurors information and relevant evidence that they might find relevant to acquittal, but then you let in lots of evidence that's utterly irrelevant and highly prejudicial. So this was not a fair trial. No, I don't know what happened in that room. I have no idea. Apparently the jury doesn't know what happened either. The jury seems to be saying, well, we believe part of what she said that he touched her, but we don't believe that he raped her. So she's lying about the rape. Maybe they don't think she's lying. Maybe they think she, it's 25 years ago. Maybe they think she's misremembering. But if she's misremembering, why do they think she's not misremembering other aspects of the case? And how do you hold a person liable for malicious defamation, that is defamation with malice, when the jury finds that what Donald Trump said, at least partly, when he said, I didn't rape her, the jury agreed. The jury found, essentially, that he didn't rape her. So this is a very, very, very confused verdict. And clearly, it will be uh, argued on appeal. I hope he gets a good appellate lawyer. 
Um, one rule I always have is that the trial lawyer in general should not be the appellate lawyer because an appellate lawyer sometimes has to question um, judgments made by the trial lawyer. And remember, the job of a trial lawyer is very different. The job of a trial lawyer is to persuade a jury using, you know, common sense, street arguments. Um, uh, a friend of mine who's a great jury lawyer says in the three or four days before any jury trial, he goes to work by the subway, not by his fancy limousine, um, because he wants to talk to people and find out what they're thinking and what's on their mind. Uh, appeals are different. Appeals are elitist uh, academic arguments uh, to usually very uh, sophisticated, not always, but usually very sophisticated judges who are supposed to apply the law. In fact, there's the person on trial and the appeal is usually the trial judge. I think it was a, a British wag who once said, everybody in England is presumed to know the law except his majesty's judges who have a court of appeals set above them to set them right. So, um, yeah, so when you appeal a case successfully, and I've had, believe me, my share of successful appeals, more than my share of successful appeals, um, you put the judge on trial. You try to do it politely and, uh, and, and, and with uh, subtlety, but you put the judge on trial. You say the judge made a mistake. The instructions were wrong. Didn't dismiss, should have dismissed. His ruling on the statute of limitations was wrong. So you put the judge on trial. So uh, Judge Lewis Kaplan will be center uh, on, 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 on trial in the United States Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals has a lot of respect for Judge Kaplan. And so there probably will be a presumption in his favor. There are certain judges in the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of New York and other districts that don't have the same kind of uh, reputation for uh, and respect. So uh, it, it's appeals are always uphill. Criminal cases, they're very uphill. Criminal cases, less than 10 percent, considerably less than 10 percent of appeals are won. In some states, less than 1% of appeals are won. In civil cases, uh, there is a higher uh, rate of appellate reversal. But this is a case which sounds in some ways like a criminal case. The charge was a crime, although uh, the, it wasn't charged by a grand jury and, and, and wasn't tried as a case of criminal uh, liability. It was uh, charged as a civil case. But um, so there are chances that there'll be a verdict. Now, what are the political implications of this? The appeal, if you take the usual schedule for appeal, it would probably be decided either shortly before the election or shortly after the election. Appeals generally take about a year. We're into you know almost the summer of 2013, and so we're talking about the summer of 2000. I'm um, 2023. Um, we're talking about the summer of 2024. Now, the Court of Appeals has control over the timing, and uh, would it decide to hold back releasing the appeal uh, verdict until after the election? I don't know the answer to that question. I know there are Justice Department rules which say that indictments and non-indictments and other things shouldn't be announced at a time and in a manner that might affect an election. I don't know whether judges feel the same way, but uh, in the normal course of events, this appeal could be decided um, a year from now, nine months from now, 14 months from now, 16 months from now. I've had appeals um, that vary tremendously. It can also be put on a fast track um, and, and be decided, you know, by the beginning of the year, by January, unlikely to be decided much before that. Each side has a certain number of days to file the briefs, and then there's oral argument uh, in cases where oral argument is permitted. So will the appellate uh, decision have an impact on elections? I don't know. I, I suspect this case in general won't have a lot of impact. It's a Rorschach test again. Uh, vo Trump uh, MAGA voters uh, um, will see this as at least a partial victory. Uh, anybody but Trump voters or get Trump voters will see it as a decisive um, defeat. Um, it is, uh, it partakes of both, uh, $5 million of damages, um, for Trump, that's not a lot. Uh, he's not going to pay it. He probably will have to put up a bond, but he's not going to pay it. 
uh, until uh, the appeal is over. And remember, once the appeal is over, you go to the Supreme Court and search for area. That's another six months, sometimes, sometimes a little less. But uh, so, you know, we're talking about the possibility of somewhere over a year, um, well over a year before we have a final decision in this case. And this is only one of many cases. In my book, Get Trump, I go over every single case uh, that is being investigated against Trump. Obviously, the New York case is the the weakest, the Bragg case in New York, uh, also involving uh, a woman and also involving uh, sexual allegations and an attempt to um, pay hush money. So there's that case, the weakest of all. Then there's the Fulton County case, where I don't think they have much of a case because uh, President Trump said, fine, fine, not manufacture or concoct votes. And then there's the D.C. case, where I don't think there's much of a case because he told a protesters to protest peacefully and patriotically. And then there are the two components of the Florida case. One, the mere possession of classified material, which is going to go nowhere because uh, Joe Biden and um, Vice President Pence, uh, President Joe Biden and Vice President Pence also had improper um, possession of classified material. But they're also investigating Trump to see whether he obstructed justice. And if they do find evidence of that, that could very well be a serious, serious case. So stay tuned. This is just the beginning of a long process that won't be over for uh, until the election and maybe even after the election. So stay tuned. You've heard my views on this, and I now would like to hear your views. So let's turn to some letters to, the, to me. Dershowitz's fault is that he's obsessed with the process instead of the results. Guilty, guilty. I plead guilty. I'm obsessed with process. I'm a lawyer. I'm a constitutional lawyer. It was Felix Frankfurt who once said, the history of liberty is for the most part a history of procedure and process. Without process, without due process, uh, without mechanisms for determining the truth, there can't be a democracy and there can't be, and the end doesn't justify the means. So I am obsessed with means. I am obsessed with mechanisms of justice. I'm obsessed with process. And I care far less about results, particularly about political results. I don't really ever take those into account. Then there's a lot of mail about the subway strangulation. People complain that I called him a screamer. Um, there's no evidence that he was anything worse than a screamer. I mean, obviously people were frightened. They were legitimately frightened and they had the right to intervene and, and prevent him from doing violence. And of course they didn't know that he was capable of doing violence, but they're entitled to assume that if I were on the subway and I had a kid with me or something like that, and a guy was hovering around and screaming and yelling and saying, I want to die and I need food and all that stuff. I might, get up and try to prevent him from attacking my child. Obviously, this Marine uh, who was trained to use uh, chokehold uh, against lethal enemies uh, went too far. Um, but um, a lot of letters about that. Absolutely not. The deceased man was arrested 43 times, but he didn't know that. Why is that relevant? And was previously charged with violent assault. He literally beat a woman smashing her face, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the people in the train were scared for their bodily safety and possibly their life. No one knew or could predict what he was going to do in the next minute. The Marine took the right course of action to subdue the perpetrator. He kept fighting, and unfortunately, he passed while people were trying to subdue and protect him. Well, you know, the reasonable people can disagree about that. I generally don't think the criminal law should be used in close cases. Um, Dersh, please offer to defend the ex-Marine. He needs your help. The system in New York will destroy him without proper legal representation. Well, not going to do that. I'm basically retired from doing uh, in-court, day-to-day uh, -day active cases, but I will certainly follow the case very carefully. And if his lawyer wanted to call me for advice or suggestions, I would certainly be happy to, to offer some. Mr. Dershowitz, you recently claimed that you could not define what a woman is. Have you always been able to do this? When in life did you begin to have doubts about the nature of womanhood? Was your mother a woman, your wife, your sister, daughters? I think you know what a woman is. Yeah, I have one definition of a woman. One definition of a woman is somebody who was born uh, with the right chromosomal mix and was born a woman. But um, my 
uh, doubts come up when uh, a 25 year old woman who's lived a miserable, miserable life as a woman and uh, really feels that she was born in the wrong gender decides to transition and become a man. Uh, is she still uh, a woman or is he a man? Or the opposite, if a man decides he was born in the wrong gender and decides to become a woman. I'm not talking about now participating in sports. I'm talking about just private life, living your life. Um, I would call uh, that man who decided to live his life as a woman a woman. Yeah, so I know what a woman is, but it's more than just having been born. I am very disappointed that you cannot define a woman and agree to, you're too coward. Anybody who's too cowardly to define a woman should not be on the Supreme Court. Well, maybe. Um, but I'm not too cowardly. I don't think anybody's accused me of being a coward. I just believe in nuance. And I believe that if a person decides that they want to live the life in a different gender, we should recognize that. You know, you could impose limitations. You can have all your arguments you want about bathrooms and about sporting events. But the one thing you can't argue with me about, at least, if she wants me to call her by her woman's name and treat her like a woman, I'm going to do that. That is just respectful. And that's just equal protection, not only of the law, but of my attitude. I love your show. I never miss an, an episode. I don't agree with you politically. Uh, you made a point about not being able to define a woman. If a can, man can, can decide he's a woman and vice versa, you believe a white person can decide that she is black person or vice versa. If not, please explain why not. It's an interesting question. Of course, many black people over time early in history, particularly during Jim Crow, Jim Crow passed if they were light-skinned, and they said they were white. Um, many Jews um, uh, pretended to be non-Jews, um, uh, obviously during the Holocaust, but even, even before that. So yeah, I think you can, uh, you can change, and um, I don't think if you're white, you can say you're black in order to get the benefits of being uh, uh, black with affirmative action. There was such a case not so long ago where uh, a woman who was obviously had no, no uh, genetic connection to African-Americans claimed that she was in order to get some benefits. And of course, we know that there are people who've done that with regard to their status as Native Americans. So I think every case has to be considered on its merits. Um, okay. Dear Dersh, how would you feel about mandatory training in science for lawyers and judges? Absolutely support it. I think every lawyer and every judge, and I taught that, you know, I was known as the and professor because every course I taught for 50 years was law, almost every course, law and psychiatry, law and science, law and mathematics I taught, law and literature. I taught a course on law and baseball. Uh, so I do think that uh, lawyers have to be trained not only in the social sciences, but in the hard sciences as well. As you mentioned, if the races were reversed of the accidental death on the subway, the report would be on the back pages of the paper and nobody would have paid attention. Ergo, nobody should be prosecuted in this case. You should defend this guy. Well, I am defending him uh, against murder charges. We'll see what the facts are to see whether or not I feel I should defend him uh, against charges of negligence or excessive use of force. 27 people were murdered last year by being pushed into the subway. The Marine was acting by all accounts to prevent a tragedy. If the guy died, that's the risk you take when you terrify and menace people. Uh, Neely's violent past eliminates any pretense to symp sympathy. Look, I am sympathetic to anybody who's homeless and, and mentally ill, but I'm also sympathetic to uh, the Marine. He he was trained to intervene. And I have to tell you, you have to give some credence to the fact that too many people sit by silently while other people are attacked. And I'm afraid that if he is prosecuted, particularly if he's excessively prosecuted, it will lead people who should be intervening not to intervene. They're going to say, look, I, I don't want to I don't want to take any any chances. Um, fantastic news about Get Trump. It should be number one among all the current books in the state of our legal system. It shows, though, how popular Mark, apparently I pronounced his name, Le Levin, 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 Levine, I don't know how, how he pronounces his name, but I'll find out. His energy and animation are compelling. We watch Mark often. Of course, not as often as when we look forward to Professor Dershowitz's program. Well done, indeed. So, yeah, um, uh, my appearance on Mark Levin did push my book back to bestseller status, and you can help keep it that way, and that will send an important message. 
to those who are trying to get Trump. Um, see you tomorrow. Who knows what the news will bring tomorrow? But one thing you can be sure, we'll be on top of it.